The Occupy Wall Street movement morphed into Occupy Goldman Sachs today. Protesters left their base in Zuccotti Park in Lower Manhattan and took their argument for economic justice straight to the investment bankers at Goldman Sachs. And it was the beginning of a long day of direct action. On the West Coast, occupiers also targeted ports where Goldman Sachs had financial interest. They moved in by the hundreds, demonstrating at the shipping terminals in several cities, in Houston and in Oakland, California, and Long Beach, California, and Portland, Oregon, and Seattle, Washington, and Longview, Washington. In some places, port management and labor unions agreed to send the union workers home to protect their health and safety. In Longview, the march of the 99% meant that workers left early with just four hours pay. A half day's pay did not exactly leave these workers feeling empowered by the day's events. In fact, one truck driver told Bloomberg, I have bills to pay at home and these people say they represent the 99%, they don't represent me. The president of the Longshore and Warehouse Union in Southern California sent occupiers a clear message, but out, saying, while there can be no doubt that ILWU shares the Occupy movement's concerns about the future of the middle class and corporate abuses, we must be clear that our struggle against port management is just that, our struggle. There is real danger that forces outside ILWU will attempt to adopt our struggle as their own. The union telling Occupy essentially, thanks, but no thanks. Despite being run out of parks around the nation, the Occupy movement is not dead. Part of how you can tell it's still alive is because like all living movements, it is complicated. Hundreds of people turn up at your workplace to argue that you should have better working conditions. And as a result, you go home with less money and it's the holidays. And so you end up as irritated with the protesters as you are with the conditions they are protesting even if they take up a collection for you. So who is the 99% in this story? Is it the truck driver who can't get through? The protesters whose families expected them to go to college? The ones who'd love to have the union job with the benefits and a little time off? Many people want to reduce what's happening in this country to a class warfare argument, but it's too complicated for that. Like, for instance, Elspeth Gilmore. Now, she's in the new Town & Country magazine, which is my favorite source for what the 1% is really thinking. Now, recently I met Elspeth and talked with her about her support of the Occupy Wall Street movement here in New York. And then I went to Town & Country today and saw her there. Now, she received a million dollar trust fund for her 21st birthday. And now she's working to give it all away and to help other trust funders do the same. She's the 1%, but she's out there on the barricades with her sign. There are no simple solutions here. There aren't even simple identities where everyone fits into a single category, 99% over here and 1% over there. Our identities as Americans cross those lines, cross many lines, for many of us several times in the span of a single life. In fact, American founding father James Madison anticipated this complexity of identities and interests in the Federalist Paper 10. Madison believed that America would find strength and stability by embracing our co complexity. Yes, we are the 99%, but the 99% is a diverse bunch. And it turns out those 1% might be unpredictably interesting too.